I'll let you in on a little secret. Mary Lee already preached my sermon for me. <laughs> That's basically it, you guys. We can go home. Okay. Ah. Let's begin with a moment of prayer. Will God be with us this morning as we hear your word, as we listen to your voice? Amen. So one of my first jobs uh, after high school, I lived in Chicago for a while on the north side of the city, and I worked at a candy store. And we sold a lot of people's favorites. Abba Zabba's, anybody heard of an Abba Zabba? Okay, well, somebody here. Bit of honey? Yes? Oh yeah, bit of honey. Necco wafers? Some people, okay. Walnettos? No? So, no? Okay, maybe. Butterscotch candies? I remember my grandfather always had like a Werther's or something in his pocket. And this place had everything. Candied apples, Harry Potter flavored jelly bellies and fudge and ice cream and milkshakes. It was a place that made people happy. It was a place that caused me to gain a little weight that I have never been able to get off. People spent their time walking up and down the aisles looking at all these different items available for sale except for one man that I remember very well. I don't remember his name, but he would come in every other day at closing time, and he requested three chocolate-covered oranges and one peanut butter cookie. And he was so particular that he would only let my coworker Daniel serve him. So Daniel would place, you know, give the items to the man, and the man would take them to, his, to a table with a little box, and he would gently put these candied oranges in uh, the box, wrap things up, and he'd walk out the door. He wasn't really in the mood to chat, and we would see him again the next time he came in to repeat this whole process with Daniel again. Then Jesus entered a house, and again a crowd gathered, so that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. When his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him, for they said, he is out of his mind. And the teachers of the law who came down from Jerusalem said, he is possessed by Beelzebub. By the prince of diamond, demons, he is driving out demons. So Jesus called them over to him and began to speak in them in parables. How can Satan drive out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. One afternoon, Daniel had taken the day off from work and the man came in to make his purchase. And he was kind of upset that Daniel wasn't around. And I said that I would be happy to help him. And he said no, and he just walked out the door. But okay. A couple days later, he came back in again and Daniel still wasn't working. And I offered to help him and he sort of begrudgingly agreed. He's like, okay, fine. Uh, but he watched me with these very close eyes as I placed his items in the plastic bag and ran, rang up his order. And without a word of thanks, he just turned around, uh, went to the table and began his ritual of wrapping things up in this little box. And so when Daniel came back to the store finally, I, I told him about what had happened. And he explained to me that this man, while well, yeah, he was maybe a little eccentric, but he was a caregiver for his wife who loved chocolate-covered oranges. And she had been unwell for several years, and so he would come to the store, get the oranges and a peanut butter cookie for himself. He'd wrap them up in a little box to give to her as a gift. And this was so important to the man that he wanted everything to be perfect. And so he was a little standoffish and uncertain about new people. He didn't, didn't want things to go wrong. And far from not caring about other people, he cared a great deal about the people closest to him. You know, sometimes we can forget that people are going through so much, they have so much to wrestle with in their lives. So I decided to push past my first impressions of this man and try to get to know him better. And eventually, surprisingly, he began to open up to me. And by the time I left the candy store for a new job, he said he was sorry to see me go. It takes only an instant 
a mere snap of our fingers for us to develop our first impression of another person. A person walking down the street who we've never met before. A person uh, making something on social media that we might not agree with. A slow driver. A transgender person. A politician that we don't like. It is hard work to push past the initial first impressions of someone and to make the effort to really get to know them, to understand them. It's much easier to snap our fingers and just move along because we're comfortable with our own circles, right? Whether that's a group of coworkers or our church community here in this room or our own families, we'll go to great lengths to protect those circles, even if it means harming others or even dying for a cause. What I find in our reading today, however, is an invitation to expand our idea of who is in and who is out, who really belongs in our community. You see, Jesus asks us not to shy away, but to engage with all people and with the world around us, especially at those times when we identify someone who we think is so different from us. Usually, we're not that different at all. Then Jesus' mother and brothers arrived. Standing outside, they sent someone in to call him. A crowd was sitting around him, and they told him, your mother and brothers are outside looking for you. Who are my mother and my brothers, he asked. Then he looked at those seated in a circle around him and said, here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. Impressions are at the heart of today's gospel. And in the culture of Jesus' day, how a person's family presented itself to the world was really important. And so it's no surprise that we hear the sound of Mary and other members of Jesus' family outside this home calling him mad and begging him to stop messing with the way things are. And my heart aches for Mary. You know, she keeps hearing these things about Jesus. Jesus is crazy. Jesus is mad. Jesus has a demon inside of him. It's enough to make any mother cry to hear words like that spoken about your child. No one can blame Mary for wanting her son back, wanting her life back, wanting her family to just be normal again. And probably Jesus had a tough time teaching this message also. The words that he spoke must have stung Mary. I imagine Jesus had a lump in his throat when he delivered this message that whoever loves God is my mother. And so our first impression of these words then might make us think that Jesus is saying to his brothers and to his mother that his own family is not important to him, but it goes deeper than that. Jesus is shifting the idea of what a first century model of a family is supposed to look like, one that is insular, one that puts their own interests ahead of others, and he's changing that. What Jesus is doing is far more radical than simply pushing his loved ones to the side. See, Jesus is inviting his followers to treat everyone as family, as their very own family, rather than as outsiders and strangers and enemies. The disciples themselves in many ways, were an unlikely family. They never would have come together if it wasn't for Jesus. They would have been like those people whose stories we think we already know, and yet they were called together, like each of you sitting in this room now, to follow Jesus, to be witnesses to the power of God to transform the world. The disciples tell us a new story of God's love for them and for us. And so through the grace of God, those disciples, they become family to one another. 
They did the work of spreading the gospel. They weren't always perfect at it, like us. You know, sometimes they ran out of faith. Sometimes they missed opportunities. They didn't always have perfect relationships with one another. But they learned to rely on and to support one another and to trust in God and to trust in each other. Jesus' teachings about forgiving our enemies and loving them are about how we are called to live and to be with one another. We are called to create a new kind of family. A family that sees beyond nationalistic or idealistic differences. A family that celebrates biological ties but goes beyond them. We are called to be this expansive family for each other because family matters. Having a place where we are seen matters. Supported and loved fully for who we are, that matters. Having people who notice when or if we come home at night, that matters. Knowing we are unconditionally loved just as we are is the soil which allows us to grow into who we are created to be. Belonging to a community that reminds us that our value and our identity comes from God and because of that can never be taken away. Being this type of family for each other is the bedrock on which we can withstand the inevitable ups and downs of our lives. For some of us, we are blessed enough to have this type of family around us in our lives. And for some of us, this type of family is hard to come by. Some of us come from biological families where we do not feel comfortable being ourselves. Yet I see this as a challenge to our idea of Christian community. You see, we are challenged by God to be that family for each other. To love each other unconditionally, even if, like the disciples, we may never have imagined ourselves linked with this group of people. It means setting aside our first impressions. Instead of making a snap judgment, it is extending a hand that says we are in this together. It means forgiving our family, forgiving our enemies, and welcoming everyone as friends. Let us be this type of family for one another. Not family in the way the world understands it, but a family that knows our identity and value comes from God. A family that lives into what it means to be a community of faith like this one here at Colonial Church. A family not of enemies and strangers, but of friends. Amen.